following is a paid program. The content is provided by the advertiser. WPSL, its staff, management, and ownership are not responsible for the content. Investment involves risk. Prior to making any investment, an investor should meet suitability requirements. Past results are not necessarily indicative of future performance. Neither the opinions expressed nor the information provided constitutes a recommendation to purchase or provide investment advice. The material presented is not a substitute for obtaining professional advice from a qualified person or firm. Securities offered through Centaurus Financial, member FINRA and SIPC. And now, the host of the Team Martech Hour, Joe Martech. Not so fast. Here's Alan Love. Good morning, everybody, and uh, I am sitting in for Joe this week again. Joe is having a good time, hopefully, down in the Keys catching some lobsters. And uh, As long as his boat doesn't sink. Uh, yes, and <laughs> that right that you heard is uh, a distinguished attorney from Port St. Lucie, who I am pleased to introduce, Greg Fasula, a trust and estates attorney. Uh, Greg, good morning. Good morning, Alan. Good to be here with you. I appreciate it very much, and I'm sure our audience will, too. If you'd like to participate in the show, this is a call-in show. The number is 340-1590, 340-1590. Besides trust and estates and wills and things that Greg does, uh, we can talk about finance, and we will talk about finance a little later in the show. Uh, the stock market, there's uh, a very interesting stock story that I have for you today. And I'm also going to talk about something that we haven't talked about on the show, I think, uh, since I've been with Joe doing the show, and that is divergences. And I'm going to explain a little what? bit. Divergences. Divergences. Do you know what that is? I do not. You, I've never even heard the term. You, uh, do not. You will know by 10.50 or 11.58 today. Uh, anyway, we also have on the MarTech team, besides Greg, who was one of the original three, mm -hmm. Dan Warren, who is a premier independent insurance agent, we have a premier mortgage broker in Mike Paulus, who is absolutely uh, going happy seeing that uh, sometimes 30-year fixed mortgages are being closed at under 3%. Can you believe that, Greg? It is uh, hard to believe. Hard to believe. And we have, last but not least, our wonderful lady, Victoria Lloyd, who is premier real estate agent for Remax of Stewart. And uh, Victoria is one of the top 100 Remax agents in the United States. So uh, uh, that is really hard to do, but she works 24 seven, as Joe likes to say. Uh, she usually sleeps while she's driving. I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Uh, Greg, <laughs> uh, as long as you are here, why don't we start with you? Uh, what's mm -hmm. going on in your field of law? What's going on? Um, it, it's been pretty busy lately. Um, I think people are looking at their estate planning documents, you know, because of this virus that's going on. I think people are getting a little more serious about um, having their estate organized. Um, so that if if anything does happen, you know that they they do that they do have the correct documents and they're they're prepared for their family and their beneficiaries. And well, when you say correct documents, what are you referring to? So there should be some type of um, document that that disperses assets and. That could be a number of things. That could be a will. That could be a trust. That could be simply naming beneficiaries to to an, an uh, some type of investment account or even a bank account. And uh, also, uh, besides those documents, uh, there are other documents that are important, like a health power of attorney. Right. Power right. of attorney. Would you explain those? Yeah, please? those are those are very important. Um, 
power of attorney, somebody to be able to basically handle your assets if you're not able to. Uh, something comes up, um, you can't do what you should have done. It's, it's power of attorney basically is someone stepping into your shoes and acting on your behalf, doing what needs to be done, whether it be paying the bills, um, you know, just transferring assets, just, just doing what you would have done if you could have done it. And the, the health care surrogate is someone that, that um, is able to make health care decisions in the event that you're not able to. So, you know, as long as you're able to make a health care decision, you're the one that makes it. But if um, something comes up where you can't, whether it be medications or, or you know, the, your health situation has deteriorated to, to the point that you can't make a health care decision, you've designated someone to do that for you. And without those documents, you know, they're, they're, there's problems. What, I've got a question because of COVID. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, say a husband or a wife has got COVID. Yeah. yeah. Now, and say the other does have the is the healthcare surrogate, mm -hmm. but they're not allowed to visit them. Yeah. How how yeah. in the world does that all get translated to the hospital? Yeah, that that's a good question. Um, I mean, with with this virus, is uh, that situation is occurring whether they be in the hospital or they're in a nursing home situation. Um, and you can't actually get there, um, you know. You, you're you're pretty much you, you're you're left with doing things by telephone, by possibly fax. Um, I mean, it's 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 a bad situation, and and this um, unfortunately is not getting any better. I, if if Florida, they say we have a death every eight minutes. Now we're having a death. COVID death every eight minutes. So by the time the show is over, that would give us what seven or eight deaths, and it's just uh, it's just uh, unbelievable. Um, well, Greg, uh, another uh, another question I have for you is, uh, if somebody is a young person, how do they find you? How do they find a good attorney who uh, specializes in your field? Well, how do you, how do you find me? Well, I mean, there's there's no more phone books, <laughs> you know. So so a lot of people find people online, but is that the best way to find somebody? No, not really. Um, uh, you know, I most of my clients are um, people that were referred from from other people that I've done work for in the past. Uh, that's the vast majority of my clients. So ask around. What about local bar associations? Is that a good way to uh, find You know, the lawyer? Florida Bar does have a referral service. And um, if you call the Florida Bar Referral Service, but th the thing with the Florida Bar Referral Service, they, they only have attorneys who, who elect to be on that s in that service. So they, the, the attorneys basically pay the Florida Bar to be a part of that referral service. So you call the Florida Bar and you ask them, you know, you're looking for this sort of a, an attorney that does this type of law in this area, and they'll give you some names. Um, but that is that a great way either? And not really. Is that any better than, you know, looking for somebody online? I, wow. I, so I, I didn't realize. So that's like the AMA. Doctors don't have to be in the AMA mm -hmm. as well. Um, well, you have to be in the Florida Bar. You do. You do have to be in the Florida Bar, but you don't have to be a part of that referral service. <laughs> oh. But yeah, oh, yeah, you got to be in the bar. Oh, man. Well, if you're in the Florida Bar, do you have to social distance? Uh, <laughs> you should social distance in any bar. <laughs> if, you, if you'd like to participate with our shenanigans or have serious questions or comments, please call us at 340-1590. Uh, Greg, I heard a story today that Politico, let's switch to politics for a couple of minutes, mm -hmm. uh, Politico might have jumped the gun. They... Uh, uh, supposedly released a story online dated August 1st that 
uh, 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 Vice President Biden has chosen Kamala Harris as his vice presidential uh, pick. Uh, obviously, we don't know if that's uh, true or false, because, right. but it appears that Politico may have jumped the gun. But I uh, think they did jump the gun. I, I don't. I, I don't. I, I don't think that's a. a done deal no i, I mean, hear it, susan rice's name a lot susan rice yeah she's got the experience i i think what he wants to do is pick somebody that you know has the experience that 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 could take over day one that that knows their way around and yeah susan rice would fit that description she was a uh, national security advisor to obama she was u.n uh, ambassador um, she's worked with Biden quite a bit so I, I wouldn't be shocked at all if Susan Rice was the pick Kamala Harris I mean she does bring some some things to the table um, but being from California I mean I mean Biden pretty much has California in the bag anyway so so what what does that give him I'm not sure well, it's going to be interesting to see who who the pick is, and uh, considering uh, uh, Biden's age and mm -hmm. uh, uh, possible health concerns, his pick is going to be very important. It's going to be important because uh, you're probably I'm not who knows, but you're probably looking at just one term. Um, if if he, if and when he does win, um, you're probably looking at one term. So whoever's in that that catbird seat does, definitely has a head start. And he referred to himself in a speech. I, this is an obvious fumble. Um, was uh, the fact that he was going to be an interim president? Oh, did he really? Yeah, which I thought, <laughs> huh? Okay. I, I think what he's saying, if if. He, he's probably saying he's he's a bridge. He he's going to act as a bridge, um, from from you know to 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 basically get us back on track. Well, if uh, if he becomes president and acts as a bridge, I hope he is stronger than the Roosevelt Bridge and the Dixie <laughs> Highway. <laughs> <laughs> uh, which which side are we talking about, north or south? <laughs> well, let's say the every south side I'm of the Roosevelt Bridge. At the every moment. time I'm heading north, I wonder about it. Well, and they're trying <laughs> they're trying to figure out. Um, it was interesting. We uh, um, heard Christina Pruel from the city of Port St. Lucie. Uh, talk about and she's with the EOC uh, there and about what they're planning on doing as an evacuation route oh yeah it, will they open that southbound lanes and apparently they will um, so they'll just everything will be outbound at that point in time but uh, <laughs> possibly oh, they man. have enough finished oh. finished on that that side now that they yeah they really no that they no can, it's going to take no. months months no no and uh, one thing too is they're not allowing trucks on the north side of the bridge it's basically right. cars and very light trucks right. and uh, uh, it seems to be working well it uh, only takes me about two or three extra minutes to get through from US 1 north or southbound <laughs> Uh, I am pleased to announce that we have another one of the Team Martech with us live in the studio, and he happens to be the third original member of Team Martech uh, Insurance Guru, Independent Insurance Agency, or agent, I should say. Welcome, Dan Warren. Thank you. I'm sorry to be late, gentlemen, but I got stuck behind um, traffic where they're redoing some power lines over here just to the west of us, and that we had a long wait while they pulled the line across the road and rehooked it <laughs> up. So, but that's, it's better safe and be late. Well, Dan, I was about ready to tell a story about you, and I'm happy you're here because of the fact that... Uh, you can deny it now. I can deny no, it. no, he, he's not going to deny this one. I have a friend uh, whose homeowner's policy was expiring uh, on uh, two days from now, July 31st, and she uh, at... Uh, 
my urging, uh, uh, talked with Dan's agency about a renewal of the policy, and she had had a long-term relationship with a particular company. And Dan's people looked at the policy and det determined that the price of the policy that she was paying was reasonable. And even though they could have, meaning Dan could have asked her to change to his firm and have the same insurance policy with the same policy, Dan knows the importance of long-term relationships in the insurance business and suggested to her that she just keep things the way they are. And this is the type of treatment you get from people in the MarTech group. And uh, kudos to you, Dan, and your people all over the place because I know this is the kind of business you do. Well, I appreciate that. I mean. Here, here's our normal protocol. If, if you come in to the office and uh, you're very unhappy with where you currently are and want to move, we'll probably discuss that with you and see if perhaps you might want to kiss the makeup with your current agent because sometimes that's in your best interest. A lot of times I'll call that agent and say, hey, I got your, you know, I had your client over here. Why don't you give them a call? See if you can make it right. As a last resort, we would transfer you away from that agent, keep you with the same company, and put you over there. So, you know, yes, it's always nice to, to sell a policy and get paid, but we're long-term players, been here almost 40 years. Um, we know sometimes it's not in the best interest of the client just to move it to, for the sake of moving it. Sometimes it's in the best interest to keep it exactly where it is, and we felt that was that was the case in Nancy's instance. And you'd want that same courtesy well, from another bet. agent you or bet. another you firm. Bet. And that's you know y you know being an attorney, you sort of have a, 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 a camaraderie with other people in your profession, and mm -hmm. and you know that you want people to at least part company on good terms. Mm -hmm. You know you don't. You don't want people to say, go anywhere but there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, so, yeah. And I appreciate those kind words, but the goal is to, how do we best serve the customer? And sometimes right. the best way to serve the customer is say, hey, you got a good policy. Are you happy with your agent? Yeah, I'm happy with my agent. Then our suggestion is you need to stay exactly where you're at. Well, Greg, uh, you know, we've talked before about uh, your practice in law that, uh, there are some uh, trust and estates and wills attorney who uh, will charge you megabucks and give you this great gold-plated uh, uh, folder with all of your documents in it and charge you an arm and a, and a leg and maybe even half a lung. Mm -hmm. But you don't do that. You mm -hmm. basically give the documents and charge a reasonable price. Well, I, I try to find out exactly what the client's situation is as far as their assets and w how they want things distributed and um, we talk over the advantages of maybe doing a will or doing a trust and what may be best for them um, ultimately it's it's their decision um, I, but you know I, I, I will give them advice and um, you know they'll they'll make that that decision well, the good thing that I look at it is this, and you've told us this before, do not believe everything Joe tells you that, I, you know, you're going to, Greg's going to do it for a song and a dance and for free. You're mm -hmm. not. No. You, you're entitled to get paid. And what you've yeah. always said, which I have always admired, is it depends on the complexity of your estate. Yeah. If I have to spend a lot of time. And guess what? That's true in all of our businesses. If it takes a lot of time, well, that's what I truly, that's what I sell. I sell my time and my knowledge. Yeah. You sell your time and exactly. your knowledge. So the more time it takes, what exactly. we don't like to see is somebody who takes a very simplistic estate mm -hmm. and blows it up out of proportion mm -hmm. and then hands you a magnificent document that you didn't need and charged you like, 
like Alan yeah. said, way more than what he should have charged you for the time he put into it. Yeah, I mean, trust can be great for some people, but, but everybody do, does not need a trust. And I have people coming in, they think they need a trust, but when we talk it over, they end up not doing the trust. But, but there are some times where a trust is a no-brainer, and I say this, this, this well, trust is one of the, is primary the best way to go. Well, that's one of the primary reasons for a trust. Yeah, to bypass probate? Yeah, that's, that's the and main primary. And you know, that's a word that you and I, we use a lot, but mm -hmm. you know, most of the people don't even have a clue what, pro what, what, what is probate in a simplistic form. Yeah, so it, probate is the process of distributing your assets. So there's, there's got to be a legal way for uh, an asset to go from you to whoever your beneficiaries are. Probate is the court process of changing titles. So whether it be an account or whether it be a property, uh, real property, um, there's got to be a way to change title, and, and, and that's probate. And trusts, yeah, if trusts are done correctly, you do avoid probate, but I see quite often that they're not done correctly, that they're still going to have, they still end up with probate. And trusts, you know, the trusts are not, they're not litigation proof. I've seen a couple cases lately where other beneficiaries are suing um, the trustee of a trust. So I think sometimes, you know, just for that fact, you know, a will can be better because you have that court process. You have the judge overseeing the distribution and making sure that that's that's the way it should be according to whatever your will might say. And when we talk about probate, the you know, one of the first things that comes to my mind is the cost of probate. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when, when I look to a professional like you, I look to you to help me find ways to eliminate probate costs. Yeah. You know, yeah. But, you know we've always been told, you know, you, you want to get it done before you die mm -hmm. because if you try to get it done after you die, it's going to cost you 10 times or more or more. I'm just using that as, a, as an example. It's very costly. You know, the people that take the attitude of, hey, I'm not going to worry about it. I'm going to be dead. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, why would you want to have your family pay a whole lot more to receive your assets than yeah. they have to? You see a lot of that out there. I mean, it's 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 unfortunate. Um, and and some people don't have anything, and they end up, you know, their, their children or beneficiaries end up trying to piece things together. I've seen that happen quite often. And, and it, it really is too bad that because they just didn't take the time to, to think things out. So you've got a lot of people moving in from, say, New York or Connecticut, something like that. They've already got a will. They, they may mm -hmm. even have a trust. Mm -hmm. But are they legal in Florida? Uh, that, well, no, the, the, you, that's going to be a depends <laughs> answer. Yeah. That's, a depends. That's, that's a depends. Yeah, that's, okay, here we go. That one you got to look at. You got to look at the documents. I, I mean, for the most part, I would say they're legal. Uh, usually the person signs the will and there's a couple of witnesses. That that makes it legal. Is it easy to use? That, that's the question. If it's, if it's done in Florida form, the way that the Florida statute wants it, where there's a self-proving clause, where all the witnesses um, sign twice and they're notarized by the notary, as well as the person writing the will, um, then, uh, then it's kind of automatically accepted as a good will. So and if I'm listening- You don't see that in a lot of- If I'm listening to this show and, and, and I have moved down here like Greg said. Mm -hmm. I've, I've come down here. I'm going to retire to the great state of Florida. I love it down here. But my will was done where I came from. Yeah. How hard is that to take that will and update it and correct it to make it uh, approvable in the Florida statutes? Yeah, it shouldn't be hard at all. should not be hard at all. And you also see, you know, the pour-over will. When, when people have trust, they have the what's called the pour-over will. What's that? Uh, that's, that's a when will. you get poor when you get over yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. A will that supposedly pours assets through your trust. The, the will, instead you. of saying, I want everything going to my children, I want everything going to my trustee through this trust that I did. So that's kind of a, a, a document that, that everybody uh, that does do a trust should have. Um, 
but my point was I see a lot of out-of-state trusts where there's also out-of-state wills and uh, you know you should have those wills looked at at the same time preferably yeah absolutely at uh, at this point I want to uh, go to a le another legal matter but it involves uh, what Joe Martek uh, is involved in investments and finance and he uh, is uh, yes, he is. I and never knew that. He's got very good credentials, too. Oh. Uh, he, he may or may not know how to operate a boat, but we'll find out next <laughs> week. Uh, yeah. If he's not here next week, have, we'll get right. the has, exactly. Have any of you ever heard of a company by the name of Eastman Kodak? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. Well, do, Eastman. Do they Co still exist? Yes, I mean, they do. Taking and well, you know, the, the, the daughter was. He, she married one of the Beatles, Linda Eastman. Yeah. That's oh, yeah, that's right. right. Yes. Uh, Eastman Kodak. Uh, Paul McCartney. That's for right. Th oh, those okay. of you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Let it be, guys. Uh, Eastman. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good, good. Eastman Kodak uh, was at one point uh, back in the early 2000s a member of the Dow Jones 30 Industrial Average, uh, some of the biggest companies in America that were industrial companies. And then their management just didn't see the digital age of film and uh, they went bankrupt in 2012, got out of bankruptcy in 2013, and have been floundering around under the, on the New York Stock Exchange ever since. And the past uh, nine months or so, they've been trading between about a dollar and a half and three dollars a share with an average volume of about 70,000 shares a day or a little bit more than that. Well, on Friday, Eastman Kodak closed at $2.10. On Monday, July 27th, it opened at $2.13 and closed at $2.62, a better than 22% increase in the price of the stock. And their volume went from 74,000 shares on Friday to 1.6 million shares on Monday. Now, after the close on Monday, it was announced that Eastman Kodak received from our government a loan of $765 million to buy generic, I mean to make generic drugs. And the CEO of Kodak was on Fox Business about an hour ago talking about the fact that their goal is to make about 25% of the generic uh, ingredients that are currently being made overseas. And uh, what uh, also was a revelation is they were already doing some of that, that they were listed mostly as a chemical film additive maker and still in, uh, in films, but basically that's all they were doing. Well, the stock on yesterday opened at $9.63 oh. <laughs> after closing Woo. the day before at $2.62, and it closed yesterday at $7.94. Now, last night in his corona briefing, the president talked about the deal with Kodak, and today Kodak opened at $18.43. Oh, uh, it hit a high of $60 a share today, and I am just getting the quote. The quote is now $34 a share. Wow. But there are a couple of legal issues here to yeah, talk about. You think? Number one, <laughs> insider trading is illegal. Did people know about it? If so, that's illegal. And how much but, stock does Donald Trump but have? The <laughs> other, but the other thing is, 
there, I would because, imagine that he has none. <laughs> because of the computer age, many people make their living trading the market. Sure, absolutely. And they look for things mm -hmm. like what happened with Kodak, where you got an explosive increase in volume and you got an explosive increase in price in one day. Now, uh, Savvy... You don't think the SEC's looking at that, too? I'm sure, you would hope I'm so. sure, they, I'm sure you they, would they will. Hope so. I'm sure they will. <laughs> but the point is, the point is, is if you were the lucky person oh. on Monday morning to buy that stock at $2.13 on the opening... And selling it anywhere above 50, uh, you did very well. But of course, another thing to consider is when you get a situation like this, you are a darn fool if you put a lot of assets in it because mm -hmm. so many times these cheapies will make a run like that and absolutely go down 20 30 percent the next day can you check rather my polaroid up. stock oh uh i will after the program uh i think i'd be wasting time if i did it at the moment but here's what i would say alan okay yeah. so you have you've opened up pandora's box okay basically if in fact and i strongly uh, agree with president trump's position of hey i believe that we may have been uh, taken advantage of by some of our Chinese or other countries that we have been relying on for certain chemicals, certain instances, certain things, whatever we need to live a better life, they need to be made here. So if, if Kodak is like uh, taking point on this and the government has invested in this company so we can perhaps be free of other countries holding that and saying, ha ha, if you want this drug, you're gonna have to do what we say. Maybe we should start looking for other opportunities in the stock market of other companies that may say, you know what, I'm gonna take up that challenge. We're gonna stop stop making this widget and we're gonna make this that, that yeah, we but, need. But why Kodak? I mean, there's all, all kinds, we oh, have all know. kinds of companies that, that actually are in, you, into making You could ask that about any company. Yeah, I, don't I, know. I, I just find well, it interesting. Well, Greg, uh, I, uh, I've uh, done some, uh, a lot of reading since this came out. One thing is, is Kodak had the manufacturing facilities ready to go. Remember I mentioned they were already on a small scale making these generic uh, equivalents and in, uh, ingredients so so they were ramped up to do it also uh, it's a sign that uh, Trump does work with people that uh, he's had some fights with Governor Como of New York and they've had some kumbaya moments and look where it's going to be Rochester New York is where Eastman Kodak is and it's going to create 3,500 new jobs. And Kodak currently has about 4,900 employees. So it is a big win for uh, the northern part of New York State. And uh, it shows, to me at least, in my opinion, and this is just me talking, it shows that Trump is really a person who is interested in helping people in this country uh, letting aside politics for a while. And if you want to voice in, our phone number is 340-1590. Now, before I get off the subject, Greg, uh, do you remember what I said at the beginning of the show that I was also going to talk about? No. Divergences. Oh, yeah, that thing. Yeah. Yes. What divergences are in the stock market and there are different types of divergences. And I'll, I'll start off with a simple one. A stock divergence versus a market divergence. Now, let's say a stock that you own is going up, but the general market is going down. That can be, that is a, a stock market divergence. And it can be a sign that the stock that's going up 
has a ways to go, but nobody knows. Nobody has a crystal ball. It can also mean a sign that if you buy the stock, you're buying it at the top, and it's going to start doing what the market's doing. 80% of the stocks do what the market does. But it is a sign, and look at, at uh, you didn't have a diversion, but Eastman Kodak gave you quite a sign on Monday when its volume ballooned and its stock price ballooned at the same time. Uh, and another divergence is a volume versus a stock divergence. Now, in Eastman Kodak's case, volume and stock went together. Both of them ballooned up uh, extremely uh, with a better than 20% gain in one day, and that... That's uh, unusual on a $2 stock with that kind of volume explosion. Uh, but a volume stock explosion, if your stock is going up, but volume is going down, is that a sign that there's less interest in the stock? Is Are less knowledgeable investors interested in buying the stock? Have they gotten in early and maybe uh, the latecomers to the party, like those people that were speculating today and bought Kodak over 50, are, are doing that. The opposite is also true. What if a stock is going down, but volume begins to explode? It can mean one of two things. Either somebody knows that the stock is really going to have some adverse news and they're selling the stock like crazy to cut their losses, or they're buying in as smart money because of the fact that they've got a, a, a sense or a hunch that there's going to be an, a positive announcement on the stock, but the price of the stock hasn't reflected that yet. Mm -hmm. So those are two examples of divergences a volume divergence with stock and a market divergence with stock. And the final divergence that I want to talk about is a market-to-market -market divergence. What if, as an example, the high-tech index, which is NASDAQ, is going up, but your Dow Jones average and your Standard & Poor 500 are going down? That's a diversion that... Uh, sometimes leads to a change in the tech industry, either up or down. And uh, another market-to-market -market diversions are international markets compared to the United States. But well, all those things, Alan, are, in my opinion, yes. they're things that the average person doesn't have a clue. True. What they do is they hire a professional advisor or professional money manager or they put it with a big house and it's the big house's job in my opinion to have the research to know what these things are doing and some people are successful and have great track records and some people are not successful and don't have great track records. Absolutely agree with you 100 percent but the reason I spent a little time on divergence was to highlight uh, what happened with Eastman Kodak. And we do have a call, and it's Linnell. Uh, it's, uh, it's, I, I thought it was Linnell. I didn't see Pat on top. It's Pat. Good morning, Pat. Good morning. That, that was good with the divergence. I like that. That's very good. That, that's kind of what's happening to our country. We're in a global catch-22. Not allowed to do the right thing. Pat, and can you uh, speak into your phone because it's really weak? I can hear nothing. No, we're not allowed to do the right thing. We're in a global catch-22. If we, uh, at first, we weren't allowed to quarantine anybody, even though they were coming in with TB and cholera. Now, all of a sudden, everyone has to be quarantined, and the nation's destroyed. With Pat, I'm sorry. Virus. Let me let me interrupt you. We are we are. Uh, getting you very low i am i am hearing you quite well you're talking about uh, a catch-22 situation and the quarantine and uh while uh, while uh, we're talking here pat uh, uh greg our wonderful producer is trying to boost up levels so uh, 
uh, the audience and the rest of the team can hear you. Uh, but uh, I know what you're saying, that, uh, that at this point, uh, this virus, we have no idea where it's going, what it's doing. And until uh, uh, we get a vaccine or some treatment, we are going to have difficulty. Uh, Greg, uh, can we, Pat, will you say something? Uh, just yeah. see. Is he better now? Uh, uh, Pat, unfortunately, I think we're going to have to say goodbye to you because uh, uh, we're not, we're just not hearing you today, but I appreciate very much the call. Thank you so much, and uh, hopefully it's not our phone system. Uh, if you'd like, uh, if somebody else would like to try and get in, we'd love to have you. Three four zero fifteen ninety, uh, and uh, at this point, uh, you were talking about professionals. Uh, do, there are professionals in the insurance industry. Uh, I've been told. Say? So I've been told. <laughs> and and you are considered one of the premier ones, in my opinion. Dan. Well, I appreciate and, that. And and uh, but it didn't come overnight. It took you years. Well, to you know. Kind of, it's kind of, here's how I started. When I first started out, I was a business agent only. All I did was commercial. I did buy and sell agreements, and I worked in that arena. And then over time, I would slowly come into auto and homeowners. And, and so on the commercial side, what I would do, I would, I would pick five new types of businesses, say plumbers, electricians, or whatever. I pick five every year. And that's all I would concentrate on. So within a year, I would feel I knew that industry very well. I knew the needs and wants of that industry. And over time, doing this almost 40 years, I have learned how a lot of businesses work and how a lot of their needs are. There are certain things that I don't do, even though my license lets me. I do not do airplanes. I don't know enough about them to be even dangerous. I know nothing. And I don't do big yachts. I do small personal crafts. Those things we have within our industry, we have marine specialists and we have aviation specialists. And why would I want to um, learn that industry at my client's expense? I know right where to send them. So I don't spend a lot of time on that. But we do a real good job in finding, just like with what Greg was saying, there are certain things that people hear and they think, oh, I need that. Well, sometimes you don't. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, sometimes there are things that I, like I had a client, <laughs> a new client came in. The guy has a nice little construction business. He wants me to look at his auto insurance. And his limits were $20,000, 10000 per person, 20000 per accident. This is a very big company. And I said, y you do realize that the insurance levels you have every pickup truck you have is worth more. Why do you have such low limits? And the guy has not, had not been counseled. Well, he walked away from our office with a million dollar policy. Yes, it was a lot more expensive, but I felt it was the proper way for him to utilize his money is to protect his business. So sometimes it's not just a matter of saving money, it's a matter of spending money for the right product because the day you really want insurance is the day you have an accident, you hurt somebody, and guess what? It is your fault, and you're being sued. And if you only have $10,000 limits, what will probably happen, this is just my, my, you know, my thinking, your insurance company will quickly write out a check for $10,000, send it to the person you've injured, and send you a nice letter that says, hey, we have done what you asked us to do, we paid your claim in full. We suggest you hire a lawyer and defend yourself because we're done. And don't think that won't happen. It will happen. All right, so the goal is to protect yourself from large lawsuits at a reasonable price. At a reasonable price. It has to be done fairly. And so sometimes I'll look at a client and I'll say, well, look, you have you have low bodily injury limits, and but you have a a $250 deductible on your comprehensive and collision. A $250 
uh, scratch is about three or four inches long. It's not, it's not much. Why don't you increase that deductible, take the money that you save, and apply it to more liability? You probably could use that better because mm -hmm. you could probably come up with $1,000 faster than you could with 100000 and you're sitting uh, next to somebody who just did that with you. Uh, I know that. And, and uh, uh, what, what I'm talking about, and I, I, uh, I'm using a personal example as, uh, as something that has given me more peace of mind, that uh, Dan said I'm uh, getting older, and even though my driving skills are good and I've got a lot of safety features on the car, he suggested that I increase my uh, liability insurance, uh, uh, and I did, and it was a very, I, I increased my deductibles, uh, and I uh, was able then to increase my liability to where if I get into an accident that's my fault, and it's a, a multi-vehicle accident or a multi-person -per accident, I feel much more peace of mind having that extra cushion of money uh, where Dan said to me, what will happen is if uh, you get in an accident like that, the insurance company will just write the higher check and that's it. Well, I mean, that's insurance companies have what are called actuarials that work for us. And they are, and I lose, use the term loosely, they're like glorified bookies. Mm -hmm. They look at the odds, they look at your age, they look at all these things, and then they set rates, all right? Well, the same thing happens true with our adjusters. They look at you, they look at the cause of the accident, they say, how much are we gonna spend to defend this? Are we, do we have an, a good chance of being successful? We're still gonna spend the, the, the money for the lawyer, we're gonna still spend that. Are we mm -hmm. better off settling? Or are we better better off fighting? And they make that business, business decision. decision. Absolutely. Yeah. They make that business decision. So what I want for my customer is the business decision to be let's protect the customer. Let's let's defend it. Lot, lot just send out a check for the policy limits and say to the, my customer, you're on your own. And in the 40 years I've been doing this, I think I've had that happen a dozen times. And it always... It always gives me a lot of um, angst when I get it, but I know it's going to happen because I see the limits, I know what they've, what they've done, and I know this is going to happen. And that's why you told me to get, buy an armored truck next time. <laughs> that's right. That's Gre right. Greg, uh, uh, we just have a few more minutes to go, and I, uh, I want to talk a, a little bit about one other issue, and that is sports. Uh, uh, as far as baseball is concerned, uh, uh, I think that, uh, you know, it, uh, the season can go down the drain if more teams uh, are like the Marlins at this point. But uh, Stay out of strip clubs. But it's real simple. <laughs> it's real simple. <laughs> it's real simple. <laughs> but it seems to me if uh, they're able to have at the end of the season uh, 16 clubs that are – uh, in good shape, they're still going to do the playoffs in the World Series with those 16 clubs. Uh, but I hope that the Marlins are the only team that's going to suffer like this. Uh, is, is that what happened to the Marlins? They're yes, kids. it is. Yeah, yeah, they're kids. I mean, I, I it's, didn't know that. they're blockheads. You know, yeah. it's it, we used to say, you know, especially around the Dodgers, um, nothing good happens after midnight. And, no. and that was a perfect example of it. Right. But the problem with the Marlins, can I think I think will turn into a major legal problem, is that four of the players and two of the coaches got on that airplane going to Philly knowing they had, they had it. it. Oh, really? And that is going to be a legal problem that Derek Jeter is going to have to worry about because, you know, there's a lot of ramifications – to what is happening this week. Mm -hmm. And just uh, on the short term for us, um, it'll be Mets baseball on both WPSL and WSTU. So fans, you well, know. Well, don't they have similar things? Like, let's suppose you know you have a disease like AIDS and and have a relationship with someone who doesn't know. Is, aren't there legal consequences you to bet. that? Mm -hmm. You bet. Absolutely. So why would there not be legal consequences to this? Yeah, I'm just saying. 
if you know. It's probably going to be a whole new it's, practice. Yeah, that's we is. we have it's a short be settled, I'm sure, we have a course. short time left, so I would like to at this point thank Greg Fasula uh, for joining us today, Trust and Estates Attorney Dan Warren for joining us, and I'd like to uh, thank the other members of the group, uh, Mike Paulus, mortgage broker, and Victoria Lloyd, premier real estate broker for, for Remax of Stewart or from Remax of Stewart. I'd also like to wish we, uh, Joe well on his return trip. He'll be hosting next win, uh, Wednesday, God willing. And until next Wednesday, be safe, be happy, and be well. listening to the Team Martech Hour. The Team Martech Hour is a paid program. The content was provided by the advertiser. WPSL, its staff, management, and ownership were not responsible for its content. Investment involves risk. Prior to making any investment, an investor should meet suitability requirements. Past results are not necessarily indicative of future performance. Neither the opinions expressed nor the information provided constitutes a recommendation to purchase or provide investment advice. The material presented is not a substitute for obtaining professional advice from a qualified person or firm. Securities offered through Centaurus Financial, member FINRA and SIPC. Tune in again next Wednesday at 11.05 for the Team Martech Hour here on WPSL 1590.